Good evening, Assalamu Alaikum. Welcome to my channel and this show, News Watch. Um, we are trying a little new format, a little more friendly conversation style. Uh, the programme will aim to look at two stories concerning the uh, Muslim community, both here and abroad internationally. Uh, I'll try and split the, the show into two relatively equal halves. Uh, but before I delve into any of that, I'd like to introduce my guests uh, in an unfamiliar position uh, from usual. Andrew Manwa, uh, Assalamu alaikum, welcome to the show. Assalamu alaikum, Adnan. Always uh, good to sh be with you. And Brother Majid, uh, Assalamu alaikum, welcome to the show. Welcome, Assalamu alaikum. The two stories that I want to look at, uh, firstly, a, a domestic issue uh, to do with the, the Prime Minister's comments uh, with regards to Muslim women, the necessity of the English language, the way in which to try and enforce the importance of that. And then we'll look at uh, the, the horrific attack uh, on a university in Pakistan. So let me, let me dive into that first subject and quite appropriately let's start with yourself, Anjum. <coughs> the wording used uh, in Cameron's speech was that Muslim women you know, need a greater degree of uh, fluency in the English language because that helps in integration within society, uh, a lot of them are being left out from the opportunities presented within society, and if that needs to be enforced um, or pushed through with government proposals, then that should be done because Muslim women come from traditionally submissive backgrounds, um, and that's something that doesn't really fit well in modern 21st century Britain. Well, you're certainly looking at one very submissive woman here. Um, I think the Prime Minister hasn't got it wrong for the first time. You know, he's got things wrong many times. Submissive women must speak English, otherwise the children could become radicalized. He conflated the two. I think that's where my objection would have been, and I think that's everybody's objection. Speaking English, of course, you can't really survive living in the United Kingdom if you can't speak English. But what I want to find out is that the percentage that he gave, I think, was about 22%. 190,000 women, he said. Right, okay. I'm just wondering who are those 191,000 women? Are they the first generation who came in the early 50s and 60s who are probably grandmothers now? The second and third generation, they speak English. These women have actually produced women like me. Stay at home, look after your children, be at home so that you, that you didn't become key like children. They did some positive stuff. They were full-time mums. And if the Prime Minister seems to think that these women are the problem area, then I think the Prime Minister really need to think twice. Do you then, on the back of what Anjum saying, and this has been a, a massively <coughs> popular you know, hashtag, uh, a lot of people have come out and spoken out against the Prime Minister's comments. Do you feel that this is a genuinely sincere uh, sort of thought process, which just seems to have been worded badly, or would you think of it as something more sinister? Unfortunately not. If it was a genuine effort to improve uh, women's English, then um, fine, we would have uh, endorsed it, said good, uh, this is the way it should be. But if you look at the last three, four, five months, <clears throat> and the type of comments the Prime Minister has been coming out with, some of them have been that we need to have more surveillance on mosques, we need to inspect mosques like, like in an Ofsted style fashion. Uh, in recent days you had a discussion about the face veil again coming up again, about you know this is a bit of an obstacle in uh, educational institutes, the schools who you know who still allow women. And there's there's today sorry just to add, add that there's today documentation and guidance from the government on Ofsted preferring schools which enforce bans upon veils. That's right. Yeah, and that would lead to either uh, an upgrade or a degrade in the grades basically yeah. of the Ofsted inspection. So you can see there's quite a few things, a catalogue of events that have been taking place, and then in this frame comes this issue, which is. Uh, Muslim women need to learn English. Now the thing is, um, language, the English language is equal to everybody. Why frame it with the word, words Muslim women need do to learn Muslim, this? Do Muslim women have a particular problem with it? Yeah, I mean, what's a language got to do, to do with somebody's religious identity? That's the issue which I find straight away, which is a bit, which is a bit um, too targeted. Um, and that's why I give all the other evidence, evidence is that, you know, if you look at all the rest of the issues that are taking place, with this in context, what did he mean? So he went, on, he went further on and say, he says, I'm not saying 
um, there's some sort of casual connection between not speaking English and becoming an extremist. Of course not. That would be a ridiculous thing to say. Then straight away he goes, but if you're not able to speak English, you're not able to integrate, you may find therefore that you have challenges understanding what your identity is and you could be more susceptible to the extremist message that comes from Daesh. It, that is insulting to say that in any other language, you know, we can't communicate moral values, we can't communicate good standards, we can't communicate what is criminal activity and what is not. This is insulting to any community. The, the, the problem then on the back of that, um, a lot of what Daesh have been putting out, ISIS, whatever you want to call them, have been putting out, a lot of their propaganda drive, a lot of the, the recruitment ideas, actually require you to have a High decent standard. degree of fluency in English. So if, if you're you know, somebody who's just arrived here from Pakistan, Nigeria, Somalia, etc., and you don't speak English, you're actually caught off from that message because very rarely do they translate it into your own home, home, <coughs> home Absolutely. language. Oh, Absolutely. Uh, it will be either in Arabic or it will be in English. And the women that, that the Prime Minister is referring to um, would not fall into a, any of those categories. Let me give you an example. Um, I'm a teacher by profession. And after the Prime Minister made those comments, I talked to those women who do ESOL class, English as a second language, which actually uh, is the same Prime Minister, same party that actually abolished all ESOL classes for women a few years ago. But now they're putting 20 million Abs pounds. But of 20 million, of course, but it has a str you know, it's been conflated. So I I'd be really worried about that 20 million. But the fact is, I spoke to those women and said, help me to understand ISIS. And there were these blank faces. Help me to understand Daesh. And one of them thought it was some sort of an Indian film. So the point I'm trying to make is that the, the women that he's referring to do not fall into that category. I just wonder who advised him. Is it, is it, <laughs> is it then a problem to look at it from his perspective, as it were? But he doesn't have a perspective. What's his perspective? No, no, no. He's we, conflating we may, it. We may disagree with his perspective, and you can say his perspective is wrong, but to look at it from his perspective, almost 200,000 women either have no English language uh, f uh, speaking skills or extremely poor English language speaking skills. One of the two. Almost 200,000. Is that in itself not something that a Prime Minister ought to address? Well, if he, if he said, you see, if the Prime Minister had really thought that he cared about that 200,000 women, one, he would not have wiped out ESOL classes four years ago, one. Two, if that's what he wants to do, let's bring these women back. Let's teach them English. But is there a need for these women? You're talking about grandmas, really. You're talking about the first generation who came here in the 50s or early 60s. But a lot of the people who've whose uh, partners have come here from uh, abroad, places like Pakistan, India, etc. They have to learn English to get citizenship. They have to learn, a very, they probably might fall into that very poor category. And even that has existed for the past six, five or six you know, years. So you can look at the past 20 years, 25 years, and there has been a lot of an influx of immigration from the subcontinent. Is that not something that makes, it creates a wall, creates a divide between the, the normal British society and these people who are here? I can only speak from experience. I think about the likes of my mother. You know, she speaks English, yes, but probably not as good as you do. Where is her need with that? When she goes to the doctor, she gets by. She goes to do her own shopping, she gets by. But she doesn't have Queen's English. The point here is, yes, English language is important. It's very important, but don't conflate the two. And, and is that then the crux of this issue? Because, and quite ironically, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of the commentary has been that the vast majority of militarised, organised terror across the world comes from those who have the greatest fluency in the English language. Is the, is the problem then not necessarily in the suggestion that foreigners, whoever they may be, coming here ought to learn English to try and you know, get on better within society and to, to avail themselves, you know, within the opportunities that exist. But it's to do with the, the casual link between if you don't know English, you're more likely to become a terrorist. So on that, on that note then, <clears throat> the massive influx of 
of uh, the European migration that we've had in this country, primarily Polish, are they also prone to extremism? Are they also prom uh, prone to, you know, terrorist, you know, you know, be becoming attracted to terrorist messages because they don't know English? Okay, and the majority of people in this country now who do not have English as their first language are the Poles, basically. So where's the link between them? Poles, Romanians, people from East European, pe yeah, pe yes, of Eastern all, all, European, all, all over. People who so are even not according to the Europol stats, which state that 0.3 percent of attacks in Europe across are done Europe. by across Europe are done by Muslims means, if you kind of read the other side of it, is that a majority of terrorist attacks and activities take place by white Europeans. So they come to this country, they can't speak English, where's the Prime Minister's denunciation of, Raki, before you come here, you need to speak... Are, we, are, you, are you suggesting, and obviously it, it seems like you are, you suggesting there is an ideological narrative at play? That th there is an end which is intended to saying all of these crazy things out in public, such as that like you're saying, you know, people having to learn English or, you know, the other couple of controversies that have happened just prior to this, the Prime Minister, you know, making remarks about immigrants, etc. Yeah, well, Is there an ideological narrative that you would say that there's d deliberately being pursued? And that has always been the case for the, you know, the last 10 to 15 years, straight after the war on terror, we found that the Muslim community became, you know, under the spotlight for many issues. And ever since then, it's been one issue after the other. I mean, the Muslim community, how big are they anyway? Two and a half, million, three million, three million yeah. that's it really. And those three million Muslims seem to be defining the agenda for the entire country. That doesn't really make any sense to me. And the the economy, nothing's wrong with the economy. It's because of uh, Muslim-related issues. There's issues to do with social problems. That's a Muslim issue. Housing issues, Muslim problem. It all almost seem like that the, the narrative which, the, which parties that like UKIP, British National Party, and the English Defence League, they spout out, we can find the exact same language and the rhetoric spouted out by mainstream parties, whether it's Labour or whether it's the Tories. Is there not a slightly uh, comical issue here with testing people where uh, I think, I don't want to quote it wrong, but I think he went on the David Letterman show, David mm -hmm. Cameron, and he was presented with the life in the UK test, and which failed. every immigrant <laughs> has to pass because it is such a fundamental part of being British. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't pass it. No. Well, the guy who, uh, I, I remember this quite clearly, that the gentleman who actually devised the citizenship, you know, all the questions, only got 49% when he actually sat the test. But let me come back to what you said earlier about Ofsted. At the moment, this morning, there was a report that Ofsted has said that women uh, who wear the veil in classroom um, will not be allowed or their school has the right. But it must be a minority. How but many teachers it, do we uh, know that wear the veil? Is there not a problem Which with is the narrative? Which is why goes back to my point. Exactly. How is it exactly. such an issue? It's not. F f fair point. And but even to start saying things like integration, this is the thing. Mm -hmm. Integration is a two-way two -way street. And it just seems like it's just coming from one angle, it's coming from one voice, and it's the like from but, top, but the, top to down. The dominant uh, part of society wants to dictate the terms within society, and it, it expects that those who move here you know, would absorb into that. And that's kind of, isn't that expected across all nation no, states? No, it's not about isn't integration. Isn't that what people always do? I don't believe for a minute this is about integration. This is about assimilation. Be like us, behave like us, eat like us, support the same football team, and you're assimilated. You're like us. But the, l l let me just widen the point out to where we started. Are we suggesting that there is not an issue with Muslim women having less opportunities, being subjugated, being you know, considered in some circumstances, uh, having less rights, being second class citizens if you want? Are we, are we genuinely just you know, putting paper over that crack and no, saying, you no. know, that doesn't exist, let's not just not talk about it? Here, there are two or three things happening. The fact is that, yes, English is important, don't conflate it. Secondly, in 2012, there was research done with reference to black women and Asian women in employment. And the gap between white and black and brown was, I think there was something to do with like 27% more. Now, these are women who can speak English, who are qualified, can't get a job. But uh, just, uh, we'll come back and pick that up. But that's a slightly different issue of racism. But I've got a call on the line. Uh, uh, Abdul from the West Midlands. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. How are you? Alhamdulillah, how are you? Oh, alhamdulillah. Right, uh, this controversial that the government putting in £20 million to teach Muslim women. 
where is the money to teach uh, the Eastern European, Japanese, Chinese, other, uh, you know, non-Muslim people? We Muslim people are so uh, deaf and blind and not woken. Please don't be offended. Not woken. You know, the Americans went and they basically occupied Iraq by false pretenses. The Tony Blair's government stood in Parliament and said, 48 hours, our country is going to be uh, terrorized by, uh, you know, and nuclear bombs and all this, and none of that was found, and he had his own yet uh, scientist, David Kelly, murdered, right? Same thing happened in Af Afghanistan. When are we Muslim people going to wake up, right, and stand up for our right and say, right, this is wrong. What's good for a goose is gander. And that's what the white people's word is. When are we going to stand up and say, look, do not violate the Muslims in this country. We have our rights as well. Thank you very much for your no, contribution. No, no, please, let me, no, 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 no. Just, just give me one minute, please. Many centuries, our Muslim people, whether they're from Pakistan, India, whatever part of the world, they've been contributing to the system. We got Eastern Thanks Europe. a lot for your contribution. I, I will need to try and wrap up this topic. Jazakallah for your call. Uh, important points being made, you know, people not being active enough, people being very docile and dormant in the pursuit of what, you know, they ought to. However, uh, going, going back to that issue, are we framing the entire discussion incorrectly? Is there, yeah. is there a victim complex, for example, amongst the Muslims in that, for example, you just mentioned that a very small number of people, women, wear the veil, which is such a hot topic. Or Muslims may go out of their way and, you know, Muslim women may suggest, well, it's my freedom. It's my freedom to wear what I want because you have the freedom to wear what you want. Are those, those terms really conducive to a healthy discussion because principles are much greater than you know a small microcosm of a discussion that you can have sure, sure. so discussing the veil on a principle is it not is that not more important than the argument why are you concerned with it not that many people wear it Look, it would be very difficult for any teacher to teach in a state school with the veil okay the point I'm trying to make is that there's a min there may be a minority teaching in a religious school. I have yet to see any teacher teaching with a veil. I'm saying it's the way that this whole idea that has been framed. So you are legislating for a few cases as we did in France as far as the veil is concerned. And that somehow seems to be the case all the time. Women don't speak English, conflated with radicalization. Therefore, those Muslim women who can't speak English may create radicals in their homes and will not recognize. That's what I'm objecting to. I am not objecting to that women and men must learn English because if they can't learn English, they will not be able to contribute to many things. And that's e as their But is that not going against what you said earlier, that the first no, generation not. who came here, yeah. who didn't... Really yeah, but these are grandmas. I understand, but yes, at, at that time they were yes, not. And absolutely. they contributed what they were supposed to, to their don't family and to six, Don't expect an 80-year-old lady to join evening classes or day classes to learn English where the need may not be there. No, that's absolutely true. But what I'm saying is, you just said that people ought to learn English to contribute to society. Yes. But these people have contributed in their own way and never had to learn English to do so. No. They've produced qualified people. I'm talking about those women who may be coming as brides, they're coming as spouses, they have to learn and they are learning. Yeah. But also I'd like to add there, it's not just a case of learning a language. Mm. What comes with that language <clears throat> is a set of ideas, is a vision for that society, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what is plausible, what is not. And this is the thing when, uh, you know, it's not a very simple case about you learn a few mm. words of English or construct a few sentences understand what an idiom is, understand when to use punctuation, spelling and grammar, and that's it really. It's far, far more beyond that. And that's why I believe that these comments are not, you know, uh, can't helpful. be seen in a positive light. They're not helpful and they're not designed 
specifically to help out our community because there's been that genuine need, you know, year in, year out. Everybody needs to learn English. If it's, you know, somebody's coming from abroad, they need to come to this country. They need to learn English. That's always been the case anyway. Let's, let's forget English for a minute. <laughs> do we, how do we feel? Yeah, I think I can anticipate any Muslim answer. But how do you feel about the aspect that Muslim women come from traditionally submissive backgrounds? Cultures really require them to be traditionally submissive. No, not submissive. You see, I don't like that word submissive because it's, no, it's a, a term negative he connotation. Used. No, term he used. But English language is um, and limited. That's why he got a lot of backlash on Twitter yeah. about this. Yes. 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 I mean, submissive? As in, like, you know, they, they always. They Subservient? Don't they, don't, they don't have agency. They don't really know what they're doing. They're always secondary to somebody else. Somebody else makes their decisions for because them. Because we come from a culture where men and women have very different roles. Very different roles. But there's no denying that some women go through very, you know, pretty awful stuff. You've got domestic violence issues and all those issues. You have all those issues. That's in every society. But we have to keep coming back. Learning English, conflating it with some, another aspect of one's lifestyle, Islamic lifestyle, it's wrong and that's what we are objecting to.